I've got some background material to go over before we get into the scripture. Because chapter 3 sort of changes in Nehemiah. If you want to go ahead and open up, we'll actually we have to go to Romans in a moment. But Nehemiah is kind of a, a different kind of book. It, um, it gives you hope when things are broken. And um, chapter 3 is all about the workers <clears throat> and the work involved, but mainly about the workers. And it really, the, it ties into, and it's a two-part message I'm going to be working on today and next Sunday, on what I'm kind of calling wall-to-wall -wall workers, which is what a busy church needs to look like. Now, I know what most churches look like, and they're not busy. Um, a lot of churches are, they're, they're, they're like a society or a club. You just go in, you go out. There's no commitment, nothing. <clears throat> but you can't, you can't rebuild walls of a, of a broken down city like Jerusalem needed. And you can't build a church unless you got everybody working. We don't need just a few workers in a church. You need wall-to-wall -wall workers, okay? So I want you to remember that thought. Now, uh, this book is about, like I said, rebuilding things, and I like that. But you got to get something in your head that you can't leave things as they are. All right, ladies, let me ask you. You let your kids eat what they want, and what will they eat? The worst stuff ever, okay? You know, cocoa puffs for dinner and stuff. Uh, yeah, mm. uh, <laughs> I said kids. I forgot to say big kids too. Um, you 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 don't go up and and get get people to clean up after themselves. What does the sink look like, ladies, when you've been busy for three days and you're married and you got four kids? What does it look like and you haven't made sure they were cleaning up? It's a disaster. Things left to themselves don't fix themselves. All right? Do I have to make you repeat that? Things left to themselves don't fix themselves. <clears throat> so, you can't just leave things as you are. Say, oh, time heals all things. That's a lie. You may be able to move on, but nothing's healed. <clears throat> the only reason why your body heals itself is because you've got little bitty <clears throat> white blood cells and, and <clears throat> all kinds of different aspects of your life that get busy mending and building broken things. If you ever break a bone, one of the most amazing things happens. The mending process of your bone builds it stronger than it was before it got broken. It doesn't just happen accidentally. It's because your body's designed to work hard at repairing itself. <clears throat> and that's how churches ought to be too. Too often the devil comes in and just through gossip or through the tearing down of somebody, or through uh, uh, some, uh, something that's said or not done or whatever, and he just destroys what God has been working on for years, and the church ought to instantly rebuild itself. Amen? <clears throat> so Hezekiah, sorry, Hezekiah, I'm kind of, folks, if I say Hezekiah today, it'll be you'll know why. My brain is sort of not here. I'm not, whether I'm in the body or out of the body, I know not, okay? So rebuilding things is exactly what we need today. We do not need a new definition of marriage. We need to rebuild what marriage is supposed to be. We don't need to learn how to treat our children in a new way and with, with new tools. No, we don't. We need to get back and rebuild what worked. Now, I, uh, uh, I know maybe when you were a kid, your parents never were parents. Maybe they were uh, uh, constantly fighting. Maybe they were um, constantly drunk. I don't know, but let me tell you, God has an old way that still works. So we need to rebuild some things. Now we're looking way back, okay? We're going back to 450, 445 years before the birth of Christ. That's 2,462 years ago, if you want to be exact. <clears throat> and there was something wrong with Jerusalem. And in Nehemiah chapter 4, go to chapter 4 real quick and look at verse 2. And he said, and he spake before his brethren in the, uh, in the army of Samaria, Samaria. This is a guy named Sanballat, who's a bad guy. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 2. And he said, what do these feeble Jews? And really, when, when he was looking at him, he's looking at them quite honestly. He's saying, they're not strong. They're not mighty. They're not smart. So what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Are they really going to protect themselves? Will they sacrifice again? 
Will they make an end? Are they going to finish this all in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the, now let's get the picture, out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? So Sambala's looking saying, are you really going to be able to accomplish the rebuilding of this city? Now, if you think very, long, very much about it, the city was destroyed not just, not just because it fell apart, but because of sin. God actually made sure that that city went to the ground. And, and as much as the devil is our enemy, and as much as my flesh really causes me a lot of trouble, I don't want to be an enemy of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? We have a very bad in, uh, uh, view of the righteousness of God. We really think, you know, God loves me. Yes, he does. And God would never hurt me. That is a lie. See, if you had parents that never uh, uh, slapped you on your behind, I don't know what they were. I just know I respected my parents. Now, I'm not talking about abuse. But there comes a time when somebody had a foul mouth like I did or a, or a sharp tongue that would, that would say something um, to my mom, but I tell you what, I needed some pain. I needed the people who loved me to correct me. Amen. I got nobody here. So when God brings correction in our life and tears our life apart, it's because he has to. And he did with Jerusalem. Uh, maybe when you're a kid, your, your parents uh, took the keys from you, from the car. If you're a parent and your, your children are, are doing wrong and you take the the phone away from them, all hell breaks loose. What are you doing? You're tearing down their walls is what you're doing. Their life right, revolves around that stupid phone. Their life revolves around those friends and you begin to pull it apart. You're saying, we're going back to where I'm in charge, amen? And God was saying, when he tore down those walls through the armies um, uh, of, of Babylon there, he was saying, you better remember who's in charge. So when your life is in pieces, don't always say, oh, it's the devil. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it's the Lord. That puts a good, healthy fear in there of, I don't want to be his enemy. <laughs> so there are so many things that are broken today, and I've listed them, and you don't even need me really to go through them, but I got to because marriage is broken. I mean, I, I grieve over how many people, it's in the news every time, just, just somebody else, oh, it's this guy named Crow, an actor, I don't remember, know his first name. Russell Crowe. I mean, he had, he, I don't know if he had to, he's probably got 100 million euros somewhere stashed away, but because of the divorce settlement, he's got to sell all these artifacts and stuff to pay off his wife. I'm going, isn't that a shame that his marriage didn't work? You know what, everybody on the, uh, on the comments underneath that, that is, he shouldn't have married her. Uh, mar no, he shouldn't have gotten married. Uh, it's safer just to live together. Um, uh, lads, don't marry. <laughs> I'm going, no, 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 no. Marriage isn't, isn't the wrong thing. The way you view marriage is wrong. The way you work out thing in marriage. And we need, we need marriages fixed, amen? We need people's minds fixed. Uh, people, it is absolutely grieving how many people don't know anything. They go, oh, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure about that. I don't think we went to the moon. I'm not so sure. Would you ever grow up? And would you ever find out what happened? And would you find out that your brain is being managed by YouTube? Amen. That bit of mush inside of your head has to know some things or else you are just a jellyfish going through life. People's minds are broken. I don't know if we're, this is really real. I'm serious. I've debated some people who say, I think we're in the matrix. And I mean, it just, it's just people's minds are broken. I've never, understood, I've never been able to comprehend it. People's trust is broken. One of the things that anybody who ever gets into office, their job is not to make people happy. Their job is to make people trust them and get them to know, I will do what I said I will do. Amen. Amen. Leo Varadkar is a liar. Um, every major politician, I can't name all of them, I, I probably could, but uh, every one of them got in there saying, life is sacred. 
Every one of them got in there and said that marriage is between a man and a woman. Then when they get in, they change. No, no wonder nobody trusts anybody. Trust is broken. People's hearts are broken. There's plenty of stuff that needs to be fixed, amen? I mean, people come in this church, they want to know there's a place that their heart is safe. They don't need a sharp word. They don't need a, a unless it's from me, they don't need a, uh, um, a um, uh, you know, to be torn down. They, they want to know that their heart is safe. And because outside, their heart's constantly broken. This ought to be a safe place, amen? People's faith is broken. Our faith is not in visions. It's not in, in, in uh, uh, mist and clouds and, and uh, uh, dreams and, and um, uh, you know, feelings. What's our, what's our faith in? The Word of God. And you need, a, you need a faith that is built upon something that doesn't change. Doesn't have verses dropping out from version to version. Doesn't have changing from hell to Hades. And society's broken. And if, if anything is true, it's our day and age where people are considering murdering in Ireland, murdering the, the baby in the womb. It's just incomprehensible. Society's broken. So when we look at chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Nehemiah, and, and at the, I started the first Sunday of January. We worked verse by verse through the book of Nehemiah up until chapter 3, verse 1. Last time, I taught you about how to rebuild. Where do you begin? And you let the high priest begin, amen? And who's our high priest? Jesus Christ. You begin at the sheep gate. The sheep gate was where the lamb was brought in and then was examined and seen that it was perfect and then was sacrificed for sin. You better, you better uh, allow a lamb without spot or blemish to take your place because you're never, ever, ever going to get fixed until Jesus saves your soul. So we, you, you begin at the sheep gate. You've got to repair that desire to walk with God that is, that is fixed, not by your goodness, but by a lamb, making it possible. It's the innocent dying for the guilty. It's the innocent coming under the wrath of God so that the forgiveness of God comes on you. If you don't fix that sheep gate, that's that sheep gate between you and God. If you don't fix that, nothing else matters. Then you sanctify it. You make it beautiful. You make, yeah, listen, that's why people dress up on Sunday. I mean, I, you can dress anything any way you want, but I can tell how much you honor the Lord Jesus by how you dress on a Sunday. I'm not talking about you have to wear pearls and hats and braided hair, uh, but if you've got some better clothes that you'll wear to work than you will to church, I wonder why. I wonder why. You say, what am I trying to do, show off? No, I'm not asking you to show off. I'm asking you to beautify this day. I'm asking you to make it that, you know what? I'm not some slob just coming in off the street, man. I'm a Christian. And I want to shave. I want to take a shower. I want to come and I want to be a blessing. I want to serve. So sanctify this place. Sanctify the work that you're about to get into, man. Magnify what you do. And then we learn that you can't do it alone. Look there in chapter 3. <clears throat> I'll make this statement here again in a minute. Chapter 3, it says, Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it. They set up the doors of it, even to, unto the tower of Mia. They sanctified it in the tower of Hananiel. Verse 2 says, And next unto him builded the men of Jericho, and next to them builded Zachar the son of Imri. Down to verse 4, And next unto them repaired Merimah. Go down to the next verse, verse 5, And next unto them. You see what's going on? Wall-to-wall -wall workers. You can't just, you can't just expect, oh, I, I can fix my kids. No, you need to get some counsel. Oh, I can fix my brain. I'll just watch more YouTubes. Uh, no, you need some help. You need some counsel. You need to sit down, be honest, talk with somebody. That's why you need to have good, godly friends. By the way, make friends more spiritual than you, not more stupid. Amen. Make a friend with somebody who you believe gets answers to prayer because you're going to need them someday. So this morning, we're going to start the rest of chapter 3. We're only going to get a bit of the way through. And by way of background, I need now to go to Romans. <clears throat> go to Romans chapter 15. This was one of our verses at men's camp. <clears throat> Romans chapter 15. Verse 4, 
we've referred to this before, but it's, it's a good foundation here. Romans 15 and verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, that just simply means the things that were written in the Old Testament, in the past, they were written for our enjoyment. Yes or no? No, there's sometimes you're reading your Bible and it's not enjoyable. You know what you're doing? You're learning. You're going through and going A, B, C, D, E, all the way through. And it goes on. They were written for our learning. Why? So that we, through patience and the comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. I love that word. I love that word. You know, this morning, as we dive into chapter 3, 38 individual workers are named in this chapter. 42 different kinds of people are identified. Some of them were masons, some of them were carpenters, Levites, priests, merchants, apothecaries. What's apothecary? What's an apothecary? Chemist, pharmacist, goldsmiths, men, women, sons and daughters. These were the workers that Nehemiah didn't name, but their labors were all important to the task of rebuilding the ruined city of Jerusalem. I, I read this, evangelist Dwight Moody. He was a great preacher back in the 1800s, he said this, a great many people have got a false idea about the church. They've got an idea that the church is a place to rest in, to sleep in, some of you. Their idea is to get into a nicely cushioned pew and contribute to the charities, listen to the minister, and to do their share to keep the church out of bankruptcy is all they want. But the idea of work for them Actual work in the church never enters their mind. So God put a book called Nehemiah in there. So here's Nehemiah. Now he records an overview of all this work that's going to go on there. And in chapter 3, he takes a look and he sees starting at the sheep gate. Now, um, he, um, the sheep gate's all the way up here at the top where the, tem where the temple is. And this is how the old Jerusalem looked. It was three kilometers, it looks kind of small here, but it was three kilometers around. And up here was the temple, and there was a, a gate up here at the very top leading up towards Beth, uh, to Bethlehem. And he started up there, and he begins to describe all these different gates. So he starts at the sheep gate, then he runs down, and he's going counterclockwise. He goes around this way as he lists all the different gates and entryways and exitways of the city. So it's about the fish gate, the old gate the valley gate, the dung gate, the fountain gate, the water gate, the horse gate, the eastern gate. Oh, that's a special one. Don't read your Bible too fast. You might pass a gem there. Uh, the Mithcad gate, and then the gate of Ephraim. So by the time you've gone through all of these things, you're, you start up here with the, with the sheep gate, and you run around through this this these city walls, and really I'm not trying to teach you about the technicalities of, of building and rebuilding this city, but I want you to understand, Nehemiah lists 11 gates, and they are important, because each one has a very practical application to the Christian. I, I hope next week to spend a little bit of time on the valley gate. How many you know Psalm 23? Yea, though I, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know what happens mainly in a valley? Now, in a valley is rich soil. You can plant. You get crops out of a valley. Lilies bloom in a valley, amen? But you know what else happens in a valley? War. You don't fight on the mountaintops. You know where, where battles are fought? In the valley. And there's sometimes the Lord says, come out this gate today. We're going through the valley gate. We're going to go for a while down into the valley. I'll get you out the other side, but right now we need to take the trip. See, each one of these gates, there are actually more gates in Jerusalem than just these 11. But these are the ones the Lord recorded here for us to learn from. So evidently, there's a lot of work to do. I mean, these things are all going on consecutively, going on at the same time. So they're not, they're not building here and then moving on and building the next gate and then moving on and building the next gate and then moving on and building... No, it's all going on simultaneously. And by the way, that's how church works. While I'm preaching, there's teaching going on. There's, there's control going on in the crash. Uh, you know, um, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, there are a lot of things going on simultaneously. And you're just sitting there and you're thinking, wow, it's so restful here because somebody else has worked. 
So evidently there's a lot of work to do. They're out there clearing the rubble and the rubbish and the piles of rubbish. And by the way, you can't build upon rubble. You can't build on gravel. You can't build on crumbled stone. You're going to have to clear it away. Um, thankfully, not only was, you know, there's a lot of work to do, but thankfully there were enough workers. And, and that's, a great, that's a great joy. Nehemiah, this, this book of Nehemiah, if you go back to Nehemiah now, Nehemiah is, his, is him writing a journal, and as he looks out on all the people that have gathered around the city walls, it must have been awesome to see hundreds and hundreds of people gather every morning and take their places and work from sunup to sundown on this big task. Let me tell you, there's a, there's a different kind of church that I want to have than the normal church. Most normal churches are gathering places, but the Bible doesn't say gather together. You know what your Bible says? The Bible uses the word assemble. The Bible says, uh, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Because it's like a work crew. The work crew doesn't just gather at the, at the start of the day. No, the work crew assembles and they get their instructions. They know exactly what they got to do and they know their teams and they know where they're going. Amen? And a church gets together not so that people can gather. I'm glad for anybody that comes in off the street. Amen? But you know what? We get together and assemble ourselves together for a work. And by the way, it's for all of us. And when everybody's busy, a lot gets done. The entire wall and all the gates are built in just 56 days. It's unheard of. It's fantastic. Because they had a lot of workers. Now, I hope that you kind of get blown away as we look, over, especially over the next two days. Because when you look at these workers, hopefully maybe you'll see yourself or you'll see your family going, all right, God did the hard thing. God took Israel, the, this nation of Judah, let me be real specific, these people that were captives, they were not free in Babylon and he freed them. They couldn't do that. They had no weapons. They had no way to fight. They had no voice. And yet there was Cyrus the king saying, you guys are free unheard of. So God did the impossible. Hey, didn't God do the impossible for you? Didn't he reach down to the miry clay and save your soul? You could never save yourself. You could never fix yourself. You could never even write yourself. All you could do is cry out to save me. And the Lord said, I can do that. <laughs> and he reached down there and did the impossible. And then he says, now there's, there's some work that needs to be done, lad better. I did the hard part. You get the easy part. And I sometimes think it's hard. You know, humbling yourself to your wife when you've argued with her is hard, isn't it? Amen? Amen. Yeah. Well, I got one out of him. Amen. I, saw, I thought you were going to say, Jesus. But that's nothing like the miracle of God giving you the wife. Amen? He did the hard part. Amen. Amen. Honestly, when we start to see that the work that we've got to do, hard as it is, is nothing like the impossible work that God did by, by giving us life and breath and forgiveness and, and, a, and a church and a family, that we couldn't do. God did it. So uh, I wanted you to, to, to just get some hope this morning. Now, let's pray. Father, um, thank you for our chance to um, go through some, some scripture. And really, there's so much to do, I had to stop. I, I can't even really just barely get started because I, I, I need to say all these things, but I feel like I'm in the way, and I ask that now you would get in the lead. You touch somebody's heart and encourage them. Lord, uh, we got a lot of rebuilding to do, and most of the time we're discouraged. Most of the time we think it's too far gone. Most of the time we, we walk away from the task simply because we say it can't be done. But, Lord, you're trying to convince us here in this book that it's, it can be done. It's got to be done. You've already done the impossible. There are things that can't be done, but this can be. And if there's a problem in our life, you can strengthen us. If there's a, a, a battle that's got to be fought, you can fight it, not us. We've got to stop wrestling with flesh and blood. Lord, give us some encouragement this morning that, that whatever, picking up bricks, piling them back on, building this thing, a brick at a time maybe, works. Help us to have that faith. We, we don't have the understanding. We'll never have the wisdom. 
We don't know what all we're doing, but we just know if we do it your way, it will come about with your results. So, Lord, please encourage us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, what was everybody rebuilding? All right. I mean, we'll go back to chapter 1 and verse 3. And I'll say this. They were determined to rebuild the wall. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 3. Nehemiah 1, 3 says, And they said unto me, Nehemiah, this is the very beginning there. We started in January. He's wondering, how are things going to Jerusalem? I hear that Ezra's back there and, and uh, the, the, the temple's being rebuilt. How are the walls? How are the gates? It's a city back secure. And verse 3 says, They said unto me, The remnant that are left, left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction. They're not doing well. And they're in reproach. They're being, they're, they're being mocked. They're being taken advantage of. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down. And the gates thereof are burned with fire. Now that, that cut Nehemiah. Go to chapter 2. Chapter 2 and verse 17. This is Nehemiah talking as he arrives in Jerusalem and he surveys and he looks out on that job to do. And then he looks at the people who are looking at him saying, what are you here for? And he says this, Then said I unto them, chapter 2, 17, Ye see the distress that we are all in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more reproach. Then I told them of the good hand of my God, which, is, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Yeah. Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. So they were determined to rebuild that wall. Uh, now, walls are meant to be a, a thing of defense. You know, um, it's a good thing to have walls. I know the world says, get down and get rid of all borders, but I'm telling you, don't be stupid. Everybody that says get rid of borders has 15-foot high walls and armed guards protecting them. All these politicians and movie stars who are against guns have armed bodyguards. Don't you believe a word that is ever spoken out of Hollywood? We need things that protect us. We need walls that protect us as a line of defense. You know, there are some people who are wanting that they 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 kind of are kind of afraid of the community they're in, so they build a gated community. Hear that word gate in there? I wonder where that came from. <laughs> Your Bible, in Jerusalem, they were going to rebuild it again as a gated community, a protected community. Now it protected them against wild animals. How many would like to have a, um, a wild lion just roaming the streets? Kids, get out of the street. I told you not to play with a lion. You know, wolves actually made it so because they lived in a wilderness, lions did just come walking through. And so the wall was there for defense, but it also defended them against attacking enemies. Walls are there to divide. You know, I have some walls, folks. And maybe, maybe you don't like it, but I have some walls between me and other women. Amen. And that is supposed to be, that is a divider. Uh, you're, you're not going to get into my bubble. I'm not going to get into your bubble. Amen. Because I need a wall there. And gentlemen, all of us need walls there. There's a line where you just don't cross. So when it comes to wolves, there needs to be a dividing line where anybody knows that a woman's not just going to come up and take my hand. Amen? I don't care what the song says. A dividing line. That thing says, in, out. Amen? And there's, it's right to have that type of a, of a life where as a Christian, i got some walls. I don't. Go pick up a bottle of Guinness. I have a wall. I have no desire to ever cross that line. I have all kinds of dividing walls. Those are called convictions. Things that I believe are absolutes. They're unmovable lines. Most people want no walls today. You know, I, I know people, I, I have some friends in Europe and they're kind of loose friends. But I have some friends in Europe, you know what they say? Now we're kind of in a mixed company, but understand what I'm about to say. They don't believe in having any closed doors in their home. 
Now let that sink in for a second. I think that's wrong, amen? It's 100% wrong. No closed doors in a house. No, you need, some, you need some gates. You need some walls, amen? It divides and says, Mommy and Daddy are in here. You guys go play, amen? You guys go to bed, <laughs> amen? You know, uh, Ephesians 5.11 says this, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, whether on the Internet or down at the pub or at the disco. Have nothing to do with them, but rather reprove them. You know, you can actually... You know, I'll just... It's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. I don't want to know all the stuff that people are doing. A wall is a divider line. A wall is also a binding force. You know, you... you you know, when, when, when um, it, it binds up a family, when he says, time to come home, that kid knows where home is. It knows where those four walls are and knows that's where I belong. Amen. You know, when there are walls around a city, when there are walls around your home, when there are walls around a church, and I'm not talking about big high walls that just keep out all the different people. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about convictions where we say we don't allow in the music band. We don't allow in... Uh, the alcoholic wine for the Lord's Supper. You know, you know how it is. Um, a, a wall binds us together where we all know what we believe. We know what home is. We know there's never going to be a drum set in here. Amen. There's never going to be disco lights blinking to the top and everybody waving hands thinking that they're spiritual. Because we have a wall that says, sorry, sorry. We want to keep worship simple. And it binds us. There's liberty inside our house. You've got a kid and he's out there, he's running with the wrong friends. You bring him inside. I feel like I'm in prison. No, you're finally safe. You're finally free. Now you can run around and nobody's going to give you drugs in this home. Nobody's going to be introducing you to rock music in this home. Nobody's going to be keeping you up all night in this home and wearing you out so you're not ready for school the next day. Am I just preaching to myself? There has to be a desire to have some limits and some walls that we say, the world is telling me, knock all the walls down. Let me tell you, God says, build them. Build them. And the wall is an identity. It would identify Jerusalem again. Can you imagine people walking by and seeing a big pile of rubble? <laughs> just from one end to the other end, about four kilometers long, and just, what is that? Oh, it looks like a dump. But then after 56 days, it had a wall again. They said, that's the city of Jerusalem, the city of the great God. You see, when you build those walls, people will go, so that's what a Christian is. That's how a Christian lives. That's, that's, that means that they've got standards. That means that they've got something they believe in. That means that they, they have a, a, a purpose. They have, they have a defense. It identifies us. When all you want is, can you imagine if you're sitting there, you're talking to somebody about the gospel, and they said, are you telling me I have to give up my drink? No, 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 you can keep your drink. Somebody else said, are you telling me I have to get married? No, 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 you can live together. Oh, are you telling me that, that it doesn't matter what Bible I use? No, 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 no. You, 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 it doesn't matter what Bible you use. Listen, what does that tell them? You're no different than they are. But when you do have one Bible in the church, and when you do have a standard of, you need to get married, and when you do have the standards then people go, that's a church. No wonder churches are closing down. Last year, last year in England, 500 churches closed their door. They became pubs, libraries, and community centers. And the same year, 500 mosques were opened in England. Last year. You know why those churches died? Because they became all things to all people instead of holding the line. Amen. Amen. So this, this is, this is uh, let me just tell you, it is good to have some walls. I'm not telling you for to walk around in a wall. I'm not asking you to feel as yourself your superior. But listen, as they talk about with women, and it is absolutely correct, women need the ability to have the ability to say no when some guy tries to come on to them. Amen? What is that called? A wall! So don't tell me walls aren't needed. Amen? Children, people used to, I know it's been abused, but people used to know, you don't touch a child. Amen. There's a wall around that kid. You know how you knew? Because if you did touch him, daddy was going to kill you, literally. Amen. They're walls. 
There's some famous walls. Anybody know what that is? The Great Wall of China. All right. Huh? Berlin Wall. The Berlin Wall. No, not yet. <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. They, yeah, okay. It's, uh, no, it is beautiful to me. It, it was wrong. I mean, it, it may have been brutal, but whatever. Don't, don't argue with me yet. Okay. <laughs> so um, the, 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 uh, the Great Wall of China, uh, how long was that thing? It's huge, 5,800 kilometers. Um, thought I had it there. Yeah, I do. Oh, 5,500 miles long. 5,500 miles, 8,800 kilometers long. Is, be, is supposed to keep the Mongol hordes out of China and all this stuff. There's a wall. These are, these are various walls. Let me see. But, ah, oh, it doesn't. This doesn't. Oh, I had two more. I had actually three more. I had uh, the Berlin Wall, and I have um, uh, the walls of Jericho. But, uh, oh, there's the walls of Jericho. These are, now, these are artist renditions because they all fell down, amen? <laughs> but they were impenetrable. There was actually three sets of walls. There was no way to get in. And you know what God did? He just sneezed and fell down. Actually, the people shouted and it fell down. God brought those walls down. There's another one. That's the Berlin Wall. Built back in 1961 to keep the people from leaving. <laughs> um, from West Berlin and entering in. Oh, keep the people from leaving East Berlin, trying to get into West Berlin, go to the West. People, people in. I know it was, I know. But then, then there was... Then there was Cork. I understand that the walls of Cork here in the center were beautiful up until about the 17th century. And uh, then they got all knocked down in one big battle, whatever, when the ships came in. But there have been, there've been the walls in, in Yall and uh, all, a lot of big cities. But none of them are as needed as the Christian's personal walls of saying, you know what, the world may tempt you, but I ain't going. Somebody may, may try to enter and try to ruin my life, and the devil may try to get into this head, but I'll tear down every evil imagination that comes in my head against you. Amen. Now, truth about gates is, uh, 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 what is a gate build of? Look in chapter 3, Nehemiah chapter 3. Verse 3 says, The fish gate did the sons of Hassanah Hassan build who also laid the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof and the locks thereof and the bars thereof. So a, a gate, now sometimes when we think of a, of a gate, we don't imagine this, but that's a gate, okay? It's got a structure, it's got a design, it's got doors. Most of the time when we think of gates, we think of like a castle gate where the thing rises and falls, you know, like a break heart or something. But that's not the kind of gate that was, on the, that was in these city walls. This thing had a big bar that was across that went into the catch, or we call it the lock, and it just locked out any kind of attacker. So there were beams and doors and locks and bars. These things all had to work together. Now, I'm not very good at, at building almost anything, so if you ask me to put up a door, you know what's going to happen? You won't be able to open it. And if you ever do get it open, you won't get it closed again. So these guys have to work at making sure it works. Because it's got to work. If there's a fire, they need to get out. If people are attacking, they need to keep them out. I find that most Irish gates are almost useless. <laughs> oh, now close the gate. I mean, I won't keep out a chihuahua. But that's not really a gate. The kind of gates that these, that, that these guys are building are solid. They won't collapse or cave under pressure. Do you, ever, do you ever wonder what the purpose of a gate is? As I just uh, uh, implied, it controls what comes out, and goes out and comes in. Your home has walls and gates. You have walls, doors, windows, and fences. Uh, why do we think that just because modern cities don't have walls anymore that we don't need walls? I was talking to um, um, Mary Ann. She just got back from India, and she was put in a hotel in a safe part of New Delhi where they have armed guards and they have security and they have walls. I wonder why it's not safe there. We take it for granted. We think nobody needs walls. No, we live in a free society built upon the Bible. We have just a shadow of it now. But, you know, when people 
outside want to get in, they're going to try to get in. And it's nice to have some walls. And it's nice to have a gate where you can control who comes in. By the way, the worst thing that ever happened in our homes, starting this process, was the TV. And I remember my dad coming into the room and saying, you're not watching that and turning it off. You know what we did as kids? We said, okay. Now my kids come along and I say, you're not watching that thing and I turn it off. You know what my kids went? Ah. I was the gatekeeper. Amen? I was responsible for going, close the gate. <laughs> Amen? Now, TV's not the problem. Move to the internet and the computer. Then move from there into your pocket. You know what the devil's done? He has moved it so he can get at you without your parents, without your wife, without your husband. A man can sit there and watch anything he wants. You know what a woman needs? The password. Amen? He needs to say, sweetheart, let's go for a date and hand over the phone. <laughs> Amen? Say, oh, that's an invasion of my privacy. You married a gatekeeper. You didn't just marry a partner. You married somebody who ought to put the fear of God in you. Amen? And when your parents say, give me the phone, it's not your phone. Any more than that room is your room, you come to your kids' door, honey, open the door. No, go away! Uh, open the door. No, this is my room! Uh, no, it's not. I'm the gatekeeper. Amen? Now, I know some of you are laughing and you're going, you have no idea what I deal with. I know. I know. But I'm just telling you, gates serve a purpose. And when, when you read in the Bible, it says, and this gate was built, and this gate was built, and this wall was built, and this gate was built, and this work was done, you got to realize, I need to get busy building some gates and walls again, too. It controls what comes out and goes in. Every home has walls and gates. Every human body has walls and gates. Have you ever heard, ever heard of the ear gate? You ever heard it phrased that way? The eye gate, the nose gate, the mouth gate, the refuse gate, and the reproductive gate. All of those things work carefully designed. And by the way, when they don't work, when they crumble under attack, whether by germs or by abuse, you become crippled or you die. You need all those gates working, amen? Aren't you glad your nose isn't upside down? You die every time it rains. You drown. You are designed to survive. You have gates. And when you go into water, you know what you do? You close the gate, don't you? Amen. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to put some levity in here. There's technicalities, I know. But I want you to understand, these things are very applicable to us. Your gate already did all that. Now I have all these gates. Now this is really, this is really cool. You ready for this? Can you imagine you're bringing some fish in, and you're going in through the... through. One gate, doesn't matter what gate, you go through the gate and you run to somebody who's bringing dung out. We're having fish for dinner. <laughs> so the fish gate kept the fish coming in that gate. The sheep gate brought sheep in. The horses came in and out through the horse gate because they've got some problem with dung. Amen. <laughs> Flows freely. Um, Okay, are you understanding? It keeps things decently and in order, don't it? Doesn't it? Amen. Whenever you go to a shopping mall, there are different delivery doors, aren't there? All right? Deliveries go here, people go there. Can you imagine if the big Tesco truck is backing up through the main door? 17 people were crushed this morning. Please watch out for the lorries. No, the lorries go into one section to protect the people. Things fall in, things come in in big boxes. It's just sanity. So God gave them the sense to make different gates for different purposes. You know, God didn't have to explain germs. He just commanded his people to keep things sectioned off so that, so that people didn't die. As a matter of fact, the, the Jews throughout history have been the most healthy people because they didn't eat swine and pigs because they washed their hands because they took baths, because they considered cleanliness next to godliness. It wasn't scripture, but they were the healthiest people. Now, how are they doing this? There are just three things that were working together to accomplish work. Number one, it was hard work. You know, when, when you start clearing rubbish, 
Here's a kid. He says, I'll go clean my room. And then he looks under the bed and he goes, ah, I got to do my homework. <laughs> you know, when you start to clean, you're going to find more work than you ever imagined. And um, uh, for them, it was going to be hard work. Secondly, they were going to do teamwork. And I'll talk about this next week. It took a lot of people to put that city back together. And, um, and I believe we forget about the third and most important work, and that's knee work. And I kind of like the guys, you ever see these tylers? What do they wear on their knees? They know the big pads. I challenged one guy, Tony knows who I'm talking about. I says, you ought to wear those at home. He said, why would I do that? Because it would remind you to get on them at home. <laughs> Make sure you're spending time with God in prayer. All throughout the book of Nehemiah, you know what Nehemiah is doing? Oh, God. Oh, Lord God, do you see the enemy? Oh, Lord God, do you see the discouragement in the people? Oh, God, what are we going to do? Nehemiah 12 times prays 12 different prayers through the, through the chapters in Nehemiah because he believes not only in hard work and teamwork, he believes in knee work, prayer. So here's a glimpse of the work. Let's just read through this thing and I'll be finished. Starting in verse 1, just a glimpse he says, Then Eliashib the high priest rose up with his brethren the priests. And they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Mia. They sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho, and next to them builded Zachar the son of Linen, of sorry, of Imri. Now, just stop there for a second. Uh, the men of Jericho, he doesn't name them. Now there's this next guy, guy next to them, but the men of Jericho, not a fancy title. It's like saying the men of Balancholic. Doesn't mean much. But it really did because what was Jericho known for? Walls that had tumbled, and they evidently are good builders because they rebuilt them. So the men of Jericho had a trade with rebuilding. So here they are. They're right up, and they're rebuilding. You know, some people are good at counseling. Some good at, uh, at, at good at helping people rebuild. Hey, Amen. those were the men of Jericho. And a church needs people who realize their gift and go, you know what, I'm going to encourage you. I want to make sure my tongue is always used to encourage. I'm going to watch out when somebody I see is discouraged. I want to make sure they go for coffee and then I just try to be a blessing to them. Those are the men of Jericho. They just love rebuilding things, amen? Um, and by the way, these are men who didn't grow up in Jerusalem. Where were they from? So here's some guys who left Jericho about 40 miles away, and they came to do a work. Sometimes it's great. I think of, I mean, Emeril drove all the way from Kilkenny all the way down to the men's camp. Sometimes he comes here on a Sunday. Uh, he's finally getting his car fixed. People come from a far distance, and I go, wow, what a blessing. Now, they say that they come because I'm this great preacher, and that I'm awesome. and I, You know what? I believe God brings them here because they are a blessing to us. Amen? I love seeing Emeril. I love seeing... People who come long distance just blow me away. They are such a, bliss, a blessing. Now, I keep going there. It says, next unto him builded the men of Jericho, verse 2, and next to them built Zachar the son of Imri, but the fish gate, now they come to another gate, did the sons of Hassanah build, who also laid the beans thereof and set the doors thereof and the locks thereof and the bars thereof. So we go along there. We, be, we began with the sheep gate. Next to them were the men of Jericho. Then there's this guy named Zachar the son of Imri. And then the fish gate. And I love how it says this. Verse 3, again, I want to see this because I, I didn't want to miss this. He says, but the fish gate did the sons of Hassanah build. Now, this is scary. And we heard a message uh, at the men's camp about the influence of a father. When I say scary, I mean it's convicting. Any father in here probably has the same desire, and that is that his sons do a work. I know what I'm called to do. I'm supposed to work. I'm supposed to break my back trying to do something for God. But here, the sons were doing the work. It's very convicting that, man, did I do my job so that my sons, they pick up the trowel, they pick up the shovel, and they also work, even though I'm not there uh, governing and, and, and commanding them like when they were younger. There's something about family in the Bible that just sometimes just stabs in the heart and says, boy, we've got to have this, this attitude of, of making sure our children 
Carry the torch. Carry the mantle. Keep going. I don't want to have church just for us. I want to have church for the next generation. Are you with me? The purpose of Sunday school, the purpose of, of teaching you guys to spend time with your families is so that when they become 16, 17, 18, 19, they're ready to preach. They're ready to teach. They're ready to serve. They're not ready to join the world. Fishgate was built by the sons of Hassanah. Then there was more wall repaired there in verse 4. It says, The next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kaz. And next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshazabel. And next unto them repaired Zadok, the son of Banana. Sorry. Sometimes you do that when you're reading in, in Second Chronicles and there's name after name after name. Sometimes you start making them up as you go along. You know, the... the um, uh, the Hittites, the Asherites, the termites, the flashlights, you know, you just read one there. Verse 5 says this, And next unto them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. Let me finish this up. Did you notice they all worked alongside right next to each other? And next to him, and next to him, and next to him, and next to him. In, in our age, in the millennial age, most people like to work alone. They do. God calls us to work together. God calls us to put up with one another, even though the person not quite like you. Maybe the other person a little arrogant. Maybe the other person just different personality. You know what the Bible says? Get along with them. Love the brethren. Amen? And it's very important for us to see God has this work going on, and they're all working together. And that's the foundation of teamwork. Here were four men and their families put in charge of rebuilding a long stretch of wall, Merimoth, Meshulam, Zadok, and the Tekoites. And I kind of think their work was boring. What are you doing? You're, you're clearing away rubble. People are taking the wheelbarrow out, dumping it along the side, and then they're picking up the stones, and they're, they're laying out the mortar, and they're setting it on top, tapping it, making sure the stone is level, and then they're stepping back, and they're making another layer and another layer so that it is, if I'm correct, I believe it's, it's 15 meters high and 7 meters thick. And so it's long, boring work. And they did it. They worked alongside each other because they had a job to do. And, but the, the, the thing I'm going to finish with here is some of them weren't working. I knew it was coming, Pastor. Yeah, here it comes. <laughs> Look again at the end of verse 4. I'm sorry, where am I? Verse 5, it says, but they're nobles. You ever hear that word before? Those are the uppities, the high fluting. What's an Irish word for that? Snobs. Oh, I like that word. Thank you very much. Now we're, now we're getting where it's hurting. Snobs. But their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. And I, I get the picture. What's the neck for? We, we say put your backs to the work, but in that day, they didn't use that term very often. Their term was put in their neck because the, the concept was you got into a yoke, you put two animals like two cows or two oxen in a yoke, and the strength of that neck, they would pull, and they would move great stones. And there were some that weren't getting into the yoke. You know, you can always, you can always tell somebody who's more noble than everybody else, he's always supervising. You, you take care of that. Oh, you, you're much better at that, preacher. <laughs> These were the people who thought that they were more important than getting their fingers dirty. They were used to supervising, not laboring. And I believe that we have far too many supervisors. You know what I mean? I mean, people always criticize a preacher. Preacher, you just preach too long. You know what that is? A supervisor. How about you get into a ministry and find out how hard it is to get all the things that God teaches you compacted and done in six minutes? I preached a message yesterday as a little popcorn preaching. I thought I could do it in five minutes. I was only on point one. And here comes lightning. Eric. Ah, and he's got to carry me off the stage. It's hard sometimes to make things so that everybody's happy when I'm finished. Amen. We have too many people who will find fault, who will... Who'll, Claim exemption from heart. Oh, I'm not feeling good today, Pastor. I won't be in church. What are you going to say tomorrow when it's work? What are you going to say when, when, when everything else is coming at you 
It always seems to be we make excuse that we don't work for the Lord. And it makes those of us who are doing our best, when we're watching lazy, apathetic believers do nothing, it makes us sad. Because if, if, if three quarters of my body is laying in the bed and one quarter of me is trying to get breakfast, I'm going to starve. Every Christian is supposed to be putting their necks and their backs into building our church. Don't leave it to the preacher. Don't leave it to Brother Dan and Brother Andrew. I have great help. But that's not their purpose. Their purpose is to show you how to do it. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Last thing. We'll stop at the old gate. Verse 6 says this. So we built the wall. I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 4. Uh, verse 6, Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of pa pa Paseya. And on and on and on. I just want to stop there. And I'm going to say this next week, and that is that this was a very ancient gate leading into the old city of Jerusalem. And uh, evidently, God wanted them to keep that old gate. It reminded them of their history. Believe me, folks, not all history has to be forgotten. There are some things you ought to remember. Amen. I hope you remember the day you got saved. Hope you remember the day you got married. Hope you can remember the day your kids were born. I hope you remember the day you got your first Bible. I hope you remember the, the, the first verse you memorized. I hope you remember good things. And yeah, you're going to remember bad things, but hopefully you'll learn from them. Amen. So they kept the old gate. So there's an old gate that takes you back into the past. And you may need to go into that past. You may take a good look around, but you ought to be able to say, I need to remember that. It keeps me humble. Amen. You see how these gates are all named really kind of practically? So we got to stop there. Next week, we're going to learn about 20 more absolute truths, about teamwork and building things that last. But some closing things are too many things are broken today. How did that happen? When I grew up, I felt safe. Did anybody else feel that way? I felt like I could talk to somebody about anything. It's a different world. Things are broken. We need to rebuild the things that matter most. You know what you need to rebuild right now? You need to decide, I need a clear conscience. I, I have stuff going inside of my head, and I'm ashamed of it. Anybody ever found out about it? I would die. Let me tell you, you ought to rebuild that conscience. Before you ever try to rebuild anything else, your priority is to be able to say, Lord, I haven't confessed to you, and I haven't fumbled myself to someone that I've hurt. I haven't gotten right, and I'm carrying this conscience, and it's killing me. Get it right? You say, you know how hard it is. I know how hard it is. It's not hard enough. Because the hard thing was God saved you and forgave you. Now you can go and be a blessing and a help to somebody else by getting things right. Get a clear conscience. Rebuild your walk with God. Um, we had a camp. I think somebody's going to preach on this tonight. We had a camp. It was a great day. It's a great week. Do you know what the shame is? Sometimes that's all it is. And then the next day it's like this again. Get your walk with God so it stays. Amen. Imagine an airplane. You just get it up at 3,000 feet. And boom. You would never fly an airplane if you could only go up so high and then the next moment you're down. You want to make sure you get up, you stay up. Amen. A walk with God. A God-governed marriage. Rebuild the things that are priority. Build a tender heart. I guess that's my prayer for us is that we would have such a tender heart that we would love our church. We would love the Bible. We would want revival. Good living habits. You need to re rebuild the good habits of getting up when the alarm goes off. And actually getting up so that the alarm is set to get you up so that you get in the habit of the Word of God and prayer. There's always a lot of work to do in the Christian life. Don't you dare believe that we're all under the age of grace and there's no more work to do. There's no work to save anybody, but there is work to save the world. There's plenty of work. I, I believe there are plenty of workers. Honestly, there's enough right here to do all we need to do. Amen. If you just had two or three, there's enough to do the work. If Jesus is in the midst. We need three things working together. What are they? Hard work. What was the second one? Anybody remember? Teamwork. And what's the third most important? Knee work. Made up that term. I don't know if it's a real word or not. Let me just say this. Here's the good news, folks. Some things can never be fixed on our part. Our sins toward God can never be fixed. He had to fix them. The judgment that's coming against all nations and all people and all ungodliness, 
You can't fix that. God had to fix it, and he did. So God stepped down from heaven and did the hardest work. He took the wrath of the justice of God in our place on the cross, and he invites you to simply and only believe that it is finished. you got to believe that part is finished. Yeah, there's more work for you to do. You may have to spend the rest of your life trying to fix things that you did when you were lost. Amen. But this part is already finished. Amen. God made you sin, broke you, but Jesus saves you. I remember that. Believe it today. Father, I ask you to um, change the way we read the Bible so that they're not just history and lists and people's names, but they are real people. And there are tasks for us to do if we would just apply them to our problems. Lord, I pray that we got some hope today. It's not all just about work. It's about actually it working and the walls getting finished and our homes being repaired and strengthened and our hearts being strong again and our faith being unmovable and our, and our joy being unshakable. And our, and our soul winning, unstoppable. So God, I ask you to bless just these, this beginning of the chapter to your people. And help somebody to realize that the biggest work, the biggest work, was done by you. And somebody needs to be born again today. There's no other reason why that this church exists other than so that people get right with God, they know God, they learn to love God, if somebody's outside, they ought to want to say, I want in. We're not here just to close up and hide ourselves. We're here to show what Jesus can do in the life of anybody. Christ Jesus came to the world to save sinners. I pray he'll save you today.